only on the story. The president about to arrive at a place that's a big deal tonight. The NCAA football championship game. Alabama faces off against the Georgia Bulldogs, and we will take you there live as that gets going. Good evening, everybody. I'm Martha McCallum, and here's the big story tonight. It may be, folks, that we now live in a country where only the already famous can get elected president of the United States. What's known as name recognition in politics is one of the steepest and most expensive climbs for most candidates. But when you are Oprah Winfrey or Donald Trump, as the president has already proven, you are already there, folks. And last night, the idea of a matchup between these two became a very real possibility. We all know that the press is under siege these days. I want to say that I value the press more than ever before as we try to navigate these complicated times. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up. So with those words, carefully calculated words, Oprah Winfrey reached out to women voters very clearly, and she also put the media in a big, warm Oprah embrace. In a moment, Ben Shapiro of The Daily Wire takes apart what he says was an effective, but nonetheless insulting in some areas speech. He will lay that out for us. But first, Fox News Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry, live at the White House tonight with more on how this now substantial buzz began. Hi, Ed. Martha, great to see you. The unmistakable message from this White House tonight, bring it on. Hogan Gidley, a White House spokesman, uh, telling reporters, first of all, that this president is planning to run for election and will welcome any challenge in 2020 from Oprah Winfrey or anyone else. All of this uh, kicking off, as you say, the mainstream media whipped in into a frenzy over the possibility of Winfrey running after her speech and a joke from Golden Globes host Seth Meyers about the possibility. Today, sources close to her telling CNN she is actively considering it. Her longtime partner, Stedman Graham, telling the LA Times, quote, it's up to the people. She would absolutely do it. And Hollywood, Hollywood already swooning. Actresses like Reese Witherspoon taking to social media to cheer Winfrey on, tweeting, I will now officially divide time like this. Everything that happened before at Oprah's speech, everything that will happen after. And NBC, a thorn in the current president's side, appearing to jump on the bandwagon as well with this tweet, eventually deleted, a gif of Winfrey with the text, quote, nothing but respect for our future president. NBC clarifying today, yesterday, a tweet about the Golden Globes and Oprah Winfrey was sent by a third party agency for NBC Entertainment in real time during the broadcast. It is in reference to a joke made during the monologue and not meant to be a political statement. We have since removed the tweet. What I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. I just don't think I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country. And if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally. Now, Oprah has not ruled it out either, though her pristine image may take a hit if she gets into the ring. Conservative Ben Shapiro quickly dismantled her speech within minutes, tweeting, there is no such thing as your truth. There is the truth in your opinion. And he also noted that she said nothing about Harvey Weinstein, because as you look, there are these photos now on social media, Winfrey posing with the disgraced Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein in recent years, raising new questions about why she and others in Hollywood did nothing for so long. By the way, 11 years after that 1988 interview that we showed between Winfrey and Mr. Trump, the president did a 1999 interview with Larry King in which he declared that if he ran for president, his number one choice for vice president would be Oprah Winfrey. He said she was a, quote, terrific woman and very special.
Martha? Very special. We're going to show that in just a second. Ed, thank you very much. Good to see you. Here now, the aforementioned Ben Shapiro, editor in chief of The Daily Wire, who wrote today's Five Reasons Why Oprah Would Win and Five Reasons Why She Could Lose. Ben, good evening. Good to see you as always. Um, you know, we thought that uh, a matchup between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump was going to be fascinating, and indeed it, it was. Um, but this, uh, this could be a whole new level. No question. I mean, Oprah Winfrey is the most well-known person probably on planet Earth outside of President Trump, so you'd have two of the most high-profile people in American history battling it out. She obviously is another self-made billionaire. Uh, she has cultivated particularly female audiences for the last 30 years. She's a television star. Uh, she has a really great personal story. On the other hand, she is a conspiracy theorist. She is on the far left. Uh, and her image as sort of uniter, not a divider, would certainly take a hit were she to get political. It's one thing for President Trump, who basically has been hit with every piece of mud and emerged unscathed to run for re-election. Oprah Winfrey is basically seen as this almost angelic figure in, in American pop culture. Mm -hmm. And if she is hit at all with any sort of scandal, it may not affect her quite the same way. If, if you want to move from a, a place where 90% of people love you to a place where 50% of people hate you, quickly move into politics. Yeah, uh, I mean, Donald Trump has certainly witnessed that himself uh, during his transformation from being a private citizen to being president of, of the United States. Do you think, you know, when you look at America as a society, are we living in a world where you almost have to be a celebrity. You look at all the people who've thrown their names in the ring, you know, Mark Cuban, Kanye West has talked about it, The Rock has talked about it, and you know, you start to wonder if you're living in this sort of, you know, freak, freakish parallel universe lately. <laughs> I think there's some truth to that. I think the idea that, that high name recognition makes a difference, particularly in primaries, is absolutely true. Can you imagine Oprah Winfrey losing primaries to Joe Biden? I can't. I think that if Oprah Winfrey runs against a bunch of typical Democratic politicians, they have a very hard time knocking her out of the race. Obviously, the Republicans couldn't knock Donald Trump out of the race, and he was less of a celebrity than Oprah Winfrey is. I think it's because Americans have this sort of dual-track mind when it comes to what they think the president does. On the one hand, we think that the president is there to do policy and engage in policy we like. And then there's really what we think the president does, which is say stuff, right? When we think of people who say stuff, we tend to think of celebrities. We tend to think of the people who are on our TVs all the time. We think of these people as sort of the, the figureheads on the prow of the ship of state. And in that sense, if there are people who are very famous and we've already made our decisions about them, it's a lot easier for them to survive the slings and arrows than politicians who we may not have ever heard of and who can be taken down with a single scandal. Remember, in 2012, Rick Perry was basically knocked out of the primaries because he had mandated that Gardasil be used, right, a vaccine for, right. for a particular right. type of cancer for young girls. That knocked him out of the primaries in 2012. Donald Trump got hit with everything, including the kitchen sink, and he won the election. That's unreal. Uh, you know, w when you take a look at this potential matchup, you know, you've got Oprah Winfrey, who I think would be so embraced by Democrats that she probably wouldn't be standing up there with 17 other candidates. I mean, you know, when, when Donald Trump tried it, everyone just laughed at him. They thought he was, he was not going to last, wouldn't make it through the summer, wouldn't make it through the fall. I mean, that's the very different dynamic here. Ben. I think that's true. And I think Democrats also have a way of anointing candidates that Republicans yeah. simply have not had. In 2016, obviously, they anointed Hillary Clinton. In 2012, they thought about, uh, in 2008, rather, they thought about anointing Hillary Clinton. And then Oprah Winfrey is the person who helped push Barack Obama over that yeah, finish line. So, so right. I think the chances are actually pretty good that if Oprah decided to run, she'd win the nomination. In a general election, I do have my doubts as to whether she would actually defeat the president. The last poll that I saw was from March, and it showed, it showed Oprah defeating Trump something like 47 to 40. But those aren't incredible numbers for Oprah. She has, yeah. I think, 49 percent approval versus 33 percent disapproval. Wait till she actually has to go through a political cycle or two and see how those numbers hold up. I, I got to let you go, but one last thing. You sort of went out on a limb today. You said you, you don't think she was that brave. You know, everybody on that room was up on their feet. And you said she, she wasn't brave last night. What did you mean? I mean, what the hell kind of risk was she taking? She was standing in front of an, an entire town filled with sexual abusers and harassers. She said nothing about it for 20 years. She's being cheered by people who said nothing about it for 20 years. And there she is pretending that she's leading the fight. In what way has she led the fight? I sort of missed it. And just because she said some stuff last night, I haven't seen how things have materially changed. I mean, Reese Witherspoon was mentioned that she measures things before Oprah and after Oprah. What changed after Oprah? Oprah said a bunch of stuff. Well, I was under the impression that most of us agreed with that stuff when this stuff first broke, and she lauded the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Where were they reporting on the sexual harassment and abuse scandal for the last 20 years? It is literally their job to cover Hollywood, and yet it took The New Yorker and Ronan Farrow to uncover all this stuff. Where was the Hollywood Foreign Press Association Great that was point. receiving such plaudits at the hands of Oprah Winfrey? Again, a woman who is good friends with Harvey Weinstein, being cheered by Meryl Streep, a woman who gave a standing ovation to Roman Polanski. Yeah, but there's a circle of support uh, that, that ignored everything that you just mentioned um, so potently. Ben, thank you very much. Great to see you tonight. Thanks a lot.
So President Trump mused about the political power of Oprah with Larry King back in 1999. Ed just mentioned this a minute ago, but it's fascinating to look back at it. This is as he considered a run for the White House in 99. Watch. Do you have a vice presidential candidate in mind? Well, I really haven't gotten quite there yet. Uh, it's I about, guess it's just, you Oprah, always... I love Oprah. Oprah would always be my first choice. Would she be some, I mean, kidding aside, that you might oh, think I mean, about? If she'd do it, she'd be fantastic. I mean, she's popular. She's brilliant. She's a wonderful woman. I mean, if she'd ever do it. Ah, oh, Donald Trump way ahead of his time. Uh, with that comment, perhaps, let's bring in Carl Rove, former deputy chief of staff to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor, Charles Hurt, Washington Times columnist and Fox News contributor and Democratic strategist Robert Zimmerman on the set here with me. You know, Carl, you look back to that moment and it's sort of, you know, ha ha, the, uh, the funny idea of these celebrities running for political office. Um, you know, I, I think it was quite forward thinking, actually, looking back at Donald Trump to say, you know what, she'd be a heck of a candidate and so would I. Well, yeah, exactly. But did Donald Trump uh, tapped into something? And I'm not certain that Oprah Winfrey is in the same position. People were very concerned about the, the change, the rapid change in our country. They were concerned that the political elites were not listening to them. And they rallied behind Donald Trump and gave him about 46, 47 percent of the vote in the Republican primaries. I'm not certain. Uh, Oprah Winfrey can tap into that same kind, tap into a similar vein of enthusiasm other than anti-Trumpism. And frankly, look, if this is the best the Democrats can do, elections tend to be re reactions to the last election. Mm -hmm. I think the next election, the best avenue for the Democrats is to say he wasn't up for the job. He had not demonstrated the ability to get things done. We've got somebody who's demonstrated the ability to get things done. Here what they're saying is, is if, if, if you did, if you'd like that kind of outsider, let us give you another outsider, neither of whom had any yeah, experience well. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in that kind of, I, uh, in I that kind of field life activity. Um, but, but Robert, you know, I, I have to wonder if, if what happens is Democrats look at Hillary Clinton and say, well, you know what? She was a terrible candidate, but wow. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey? I mean, you know, all bets are off. Well, as a matter of fact, to Carl's point, when you look at candidates who got things done, you can point to Oprah Winfrey as a woman who came from abject poverty and built an empire without a loan from her father like Donald Trump had for a million dollars, a woman who was the victim of sexual assault and sexual harassment, unlike Donald Trump who was accused of that, and she's spoken to it and empowered women to stand up and fight back, and a woman who really spoke, and this is the most important point, a woman who spoke with a sense of inspiration and empowerment last night. It's a mistake to define what we're witnessing today in conventional political terms. The reason she's an antidote to Donald Trump is because while you see Republicans and Democrats condemn the kind of vitriol and hate and divisiveness from the Trump White House, she spoke with a sense of an inspiration, a sense of empowerment, and it was an uplifting moment. And that's what captured the nation's attention. So it sounds to me, Charlie, like Robert's saying, you know, Joe Biden who, Elizabeth Warren who, uh, Kamala <laughs> Harris who. Um... I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that they all have achievements in their own way, but she spoke from a very unique platform and a very inspiring, but, and a very inspiring but would, message. But wouldn't you have loved to have been in the room with Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and all those people <laughs> where they watch this speech like, and then oh, all the oxygen goes. deeper into their chair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I mean, Oprah Winfrey, there's probably nobody in America today who has a more sterling uh, trademark uh, brand name than Oprah Winfrey. But I really do question about what happens when you put that brand through a modern political campaign. And, and when you listen to the comments that she's made in the past, and, and, and then she's just flirting uh, with this stuff last night, uh, you know, you have to be really committed to do this. You have to be a little crazy, first of all, to run for president. But moreover, you have to really, really want it and believe in something. Yeah. And, and, and if she doesn't have that, if she doesn't have that fire burning in her, but I just know don't what? know how she... Here's what I'm hearing, and I want Carl to, to weigh in on this, too. You know, these are exactly the same things that were said about Donald Trump. Oh, he will never want to campaign. He won't want to hang in there. He doesn't have the experience. He's not going to want to go through the process. He doesn't have what it takes to be a politician, Carl. Well, you're right. She could turn out to be that way, but I think she's more comfortable giving away cars to people sitting in her studio and running her media empire. We'll see. But I, again, my point is, if this is, if the Democrats are in a, are in a fit of enthusiasm, if Zimmerman is becoming the New York State Chairman of Oprah for president, this is a sign of how desperate the Democrats are, how thin their field is, Carl, how weak would, their bench is, Carl. and how and how eager they are to grab the first <laughs> celebrity who comes along and and stands up in front. Of, as, as Charlie said, an audience that was totally on her side, 
totally on, with her on, on, on the issue of harassment. But Carl, and as, Carl, and ben wait a said, minute. The, the Republicans anything. thought they had to, such a deep bench going into 2016. They had all they of did. these guys across. And they did. But they couldn't cut it. And Donald Trump but won. You know here's, what? The, here's the real it's difference, because Carl. Donald Trump, the Republican it was because Party. Donald Trump had political chops. And, and maybe Excuse Oprah me. Winfrey will have. I just right. seriously I mean, Here's the real it. difference, I think Carl. this is the a Republican parlor game Party. moment where Democrats the, are so desperate. This is the best they can come okay. up with, and they're going to hold on Carl, to it as long the as they possibly can. Robert, the Repub the Republican guys. Party looks like a restricted country club that's catered by Meals on Wheels. You've got a Democratic Party that has diversity, that has talent. You have people. It's not about celebrity. It's about accomplishment. It can be Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, who has a record of achievement, or Joe Biden, who can speak to that, or Oprah Winfrey. But it speaks to accomplishment. It doesn't speak about just can celebrity. I, can I make just one real quick Very point? Quick. The, re the reason Trump uh, made this work is because he made his campaign about issues. And I just question whether uh, whether that's something that Oprah Winfrey will be able to pull off, too. We'll see. Thanks, don't, you guys. Bet, don't bet against Oprah, Charlie. Great, great to see you all. All right, so coming up, Alan Dershowitz says that the rampant armchair psychiatry of some in the media and even a Yale professor who's never met the president is not only wrong, but he says it is dangerous in terms of its historical precedence. The psychiatrization of political differences is much more dangerous. It's what they did in Russia. It's what they did in China. It's what they did in apartheid South Africa. If you don't like a candidate, first lock them up. If you can't lock them up, commit them to a mental hospital. Talking about all of the discussion about mental fitness, House Majority Whip Steve Scalise responds. He will also take us inside the weekend meeting at Camp David with the president. It feels so disturbing to hear that they think that something has deteriorated with his mental fitness. It does also raise these questions of the president's fitness. It raises serious questions about his, his, his mental capacity, his ability to process mm -hmm. information, his impulse control. I'm wondering if there are any patriots uh, in the Republican Party willing to step forward and at least force this president to get an exam, uh, not, just, uh, not just physical, but also neuroscience. This weekend, the president tuned out the critics, hunkered down with top brass of the GOP at Camp David to work on their agenda for the new year, while his critics bantered about West Wing drama and he Twitter sparred over the issue of mental acuity. Some who have thrown rocks within the G GOP tent have now circled the wagons to shout down this noise coming from the Michael Wolf book. I don't think he's crazy. I think he's had a very successful 2017. Okay. And I want to help him where I can, and we should all want him to be successful. I can tell you, he's got the wherewithal to do things that no politician's been able to do, and in a good way. I've worked with the president and the people around him and Republican senators. He's been an active, engaged, and effective leader. Here now, House Majority Whip Steve Scalise, who was at Camp David with the president this weekend. Was there any discussion, Congressman? Welcome, first of all, um, well, about this book or the president's reaction to it this weekend? No, not until the press conference that we had uh, as we wrapped everything up on Saturday. But, you know, a lot of those statements are rooted in ignorance of people that uh, haven't worked with Donald Trump. And, and when you're sitting in meetings with him like I was, look, Friday when we started our, our set of meetings to talk about all the domestic policy agenda items we want to accomplish for the American people, we, we were in a meeting for over three and a half hours straight. And the president was directly engaged in those conversations, had a lot of really good ideas. He wants to build on the success of what we're seeing from this tax cut bill where um, every day, just today, Visa's announcing more benefits to their employees. Every day we see another company mm -hmm. announcing how what we did, what we worked with President Trump to pass, is actually helping families uh, increase their ability to be a part of the American dream. We want to build on that, and the president had a lot of really good ideas and mm -hmm. things he wants to get done. I mean, do you think it's surprising? Michael Wolf admitted today that he didn't reach out to any of the cabinet members. He didn't interview them. He didn't interview Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States. Um, nonetheless, he does quote members of the cabinet so that must be coming you know through another party that he talked to who said that those people said that does it disturb you what you're seeing unfold here no I mean you've got a lot of third-party innuendo uh, when you're in meetings with President Trump 
it's all business. You've got a man here who wants to get our economy moving again, who wants to repair a lot of the damage that's been done uh, internationally. Look, America had been uh, allowing our enemies to run roughshod over us and our friends around the world. Look at Iran moving towards a nuclear weapon under uh, the last eight years of President Obama. Look at Russia's aggression uh, through Eastern Europe. A look at what North Korea has been doing, and you had administrations just looking the other way. President Trump's been directly engaged, working with Secretary of State Tillerson. I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, what happened this weekend in terms of, of what's coming up. Funding the government it runs out on January 19th. Do you think that the House will pass a clean bill, or are we going to see a debate over DACA and border wall funding? Which way is this going to go? Well, there are a lot of negotiations still going on, and I think you've seen the speaker talking about the negotiations he's having to make sure we can have a properly funded Department of Defense. Look, our men and women in uniform all around the world that are confronting a lot of these major threats to our nation, uh, they don't have all the tools that they need to get the job done, and we need to do more to make sure that they've got those tools. And, uh, and a lot of negotiations are going on about that right now, and, and hopefully they get resolved in the next uh, few days yeah. uh, so that a we can have that certainty. About. I hope you'll come back and talk more about that. But quickly before I let before you go, that. Ed Royce has announced his retirement. That makes 29 members of the GOP who are stepping down. Are you starting to get concerned about the numbers in Congress as you head towards the midterms? Well, look, we know that we're going to have a tough election cycle later this year. We're preparing for it. Uh, we've got a lot of incumbent members that are doing great work. Uh, you know, and you, some of these retirements you're seeing, you've seen are in very safe Republican districts. But, like, every time you see somebody good like Ed Royce leave, uh, it's a loss to the institution. Uh, but we're going to work hard to make sure we keep this majority. I think there are a lot of people out there that understand just how devastating it would be to our country to have Nancy Pelosi as speaker, and they don't want that to happen. They saw how bad it was uh, when she was speaker for, for four years and what it did to our country. We're getting our country back on track and getting the economy moving again. We want to keep that positive influence going forward. All right. Uh Good to speak with you, Congressman Steve Scalise, as always. Mark, and always we hope you'll come back you. next week because we have a lot to talk about as you head toward those deadlines. Thank you, sir. Good to see you Thank tonight. Thank you. So should the president sit down for an interview with special counsel Robert Mueller? House Oversight Committee Chairman Trey Gowdy is up next with his new insight on the investigation tonight and Democrats' attempts to keep this investigation alive for a long time when we come back. I do have confidence that Bob Mueller's going to reach the right decision and interview the right people, but you can't have confidence in an investigation where the ranking Democrat prejudges it before you've interviewed your very first witness. New reports tonight that President Trump's legal team is weighing options for a possible interview between the president and special counsel Robert Mueller. And Bruce Orr, the man removed from the investigation, has now been let go from his final last remaining post at the DOJ. There is so much uh, to cover in this story tonight here now. House Oversight Committee Chairman Trey Gowdy, who also sits on the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, Congressman, great to see you as always. Thank you for being yes, here tonight. Um, Thank you. So I want to get through an, a few of these. And I know this one has just come to our attention. This has just been reported by The Hill. And it has to do with two people I know you're very interested in in terms of of learning more about Lisa Page and Peter Strzok, um, who were involved in the investigation and then were removed from it. This article in The Hill suggests that their text messages that have just been released suggest that they may have been leaking stories to different newspapers. Um, that's, that's sort of what we see here. He says in this one, she says, the article is out, but hidden behind paywall, so can't read it. He responds, WSJ? Question mark. Boy, that was fast. Should I find it? in quotes, and tell the team. Um, you know, just going through this initially, but your, your thoughts as you hear that. Well, one of the lines of questioning that we have for the FBI agents we've talked to so far is who within the bureau is authorized to talk to the media? Because I can't speak for the Clinton investigation, but I can tell you with respect to the, to the investigation into the Trump campaign, we have serious concerns about people with the bureau talking to various media outlets that weren't authorized to speak on behalf of the bureau. So. I'd love to tell you I'm surprised that yeah. someone at the FBI may have been leaking, but I'm not. I mean, James Comey admitted under, uh, under oath and testimony that he did the exact same thing. He did when he wanted to spur special counsel for Trump when yeah. Loretta Lynch told him to call it a matter, not an investigation. We didn't hear a peep out of him. Yeah, very true. Um, it, your committee now has the Fusion GPS financial documents that you've been wanting for some time. Have you had a chance to go through them? 
Um, I have not, but one of the investigators has. And you, you know, Martha, I, I, I think it, it is so bitterly ironic to me that Fusion GPS wanted us to rely on quintuple hearsay from Russian sources that nobody knows. They wanted us to, to base a presidential vote on that, but they went to court to keep us from finding out yeah. who paid them and who they were paying. So thankfully the court ruled the right way. It wasn't even a close question. We've got the documents and we're going to know who they paid and who paid them. Yeah, and they, as you say, they very much did not want you to have that information. Very I know much. that you can't divulge uh, anything from all that. It's still, uh, you know, under your um, investigation. So we'll, we'll we'll keep on top of that uh, as as we go forward. In terms of Steve Bannon. Um, you know, all that's come out in this Michael Wolff book and his suggestions about potentially treasonous behavior as part of the meeting that happened in June of 2016 at Trump Tower. Um, are, are you going to want to speak with him as part of this? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, treason's a really big word. In fact, it's the only crime I'm aware of for which you can be put to death without actually taking a life during the commission of the crime. So I really can't think of a more serious word than treason. And if you're going to allege that somebody committed a treasonous act and you weren't even on the campaign at the time that meeting took place, then, yeah, I'm going to want to ask you some questions about it. In terms of the president's potential sit down with Robert Mueller, uh, is that an interview that you expect will happen in real time? They'll sit face to face. Do you think it's going to be on video or in submitted questions? What's your what's your estimation? Uh, submitted questions is not a great way to exchange information. There is no substitute, Martha, for what you and I are doing right now. Examination, cross-examination, testing, probing. That's what happens in courtrooms all across America. It's good enough for all the rest of us. If President Trump is going to be interviewed uh, uh, by Bob Mueller or by an FBI agent, there is no substitute for a sit-down eyeball to eyeball where you can judge demeanor and voice inflection. There's no uh, question about what the question was or what the answer was that that's the single yeah, best way absolutely. to exchange information I you. before I let you go you made some pretty strong statements about Adam Schiff your counterpart on the Intel committee uh, saying that he had jumped to conclusions on Trump collusion with Russia when he hadn't even looked at any of the evidence yet and that you think he's using that position for political purposes to leverage a Senate run in California uh, do you stand by that statement uh, I only wish I had said more. Um, yeah, all of that is true. Um, Adam prejudged this investigation before we interviewed the first witness, and he's been on television more than you have this year, Martha. So, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, I, everything I said was true, and I probably could have added something to it. Congressman Trey Gowdy, our thanks to you for being here tonight. Always good yes, to see you, sir. We'll see you, you soon. You too. Thank you. So, here now with his thoughts on all of that, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst. Um, Congressman Gowdy and I covered a lot of territory there. Right. Uh, what do you want to jump in on first? Uh, I would jump in on what you were discussing second to last, which is whether or not uh, the president ought to submit to an interview to Bob Mueller and FBI agents. And my argument is never, never, never in caps should he do that. Why? Because he cannot know what Mueller and his team know about the case. He cannot know what evidence they have. And one lie or one close to a lie about a material matter and he's facing a potential indictment. I don't know what would happen with the indictment because he's a sitting president. No sitting president has ever been indicted for a crime. But if the feds want to trap you, they are very, very good at doing it. Donald Trump is a very headstrong person who probably believes he is smarter than his interrogators, and he may be, but he doesn't know more about the case than they do. It's a trap, and he ought to stay away from it. All right, so if you're the White House attorneys, you are trying to push at this point for submitted questions and answers on paper, and it, it, will they get that? Will, no. will the special counsel? If I'm the White House that? attorneys, I don't want my client Nothing. to communicate with uh, Bob Mueller at all. Bob Mueller and his team. Do they have to? No, they absolutely don't. They don't. He, he doesn't have to speak to them. They can ask for it, and he can say, thank you, no, I'm the president. I have more important things to do. That's the advice that I would give to him. That is pretty much standard advice. Now, you have, I've never represented the president. You have an extremely strong-willed person who may very well say, I'm going to talk to them no matter what you want, and I'm going to go do it even if you don't come with me. Then you've got a problem when your client rejects your advice. Well, what, what about the, the Steve Bannon uh, discussion about treasonous behavior? What do you think about that? I agree with Congressman Gowdy. It is the only crime defined in the Constitution, but it, it, this is not treason. I mean, treason is defined as 
uh, providing aid and comfort to the enemy or waging war against the United States. I assumed this was hyperbole on Steve Bannon's part. Now, whether he has to justify that hyperbole under oath to a congressional committee, I'm not so sure that he has to, or um, they probably have better things to do than, than ask him about that. This wasn't treason. It wasn't even close to treason. Thank you very much. Judge Andrew Napolitano, Anytime. always good to see you, Anytime. sir. Anytime. Thanks good for coming in. You, you too. Good to have you back. All right, so while most people in Washington are arguing about a book, there is something very big and very real happening that could reshape the dynamic across the Middle East. So how should President Trump respond to what could become, if this moves forward, a very significant Arab Spring-like movement? So while D.C. is all knotted up in the book buzz issue, there is something really big and very real that is happening that could trigger the end, potentially, of the regime in Iran. So how should the White House respond? What should they be doing behind the scenes with all of this? This was the suggestion, if you remember, from Susan Rice. How can Trump help Iran's protesters be quiet, she wrote. And that is exactly what did not work last time in 2009, even as this 26-year-old woman's death became a powerful symbol that ordinary Iranians wanted desperately to overthrow their government's tight religious reins. The Obama administration back then remained quiet. But the president now has spoken out very forcefully. And a new report in Politico magazine says that this time it could be very well different. This is a quote from that piece. We are witnessing the death throes of the Islamic Republic. Even if the uprising ends today, it is but one step in a long struggle to achieve a more representative, democratic, and popular government. Here now, Michael Waltz, former Green Beret commander and Fox News contributor, and David Jafori, former State Department official and Obama campaign foreign policy advisor. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to have both of you with us tonight. Um, Evening. So, David, you've heard those criticisms of, of the administration that you worked in, that at the moment that it could have been very instrumental to have American help, there was none. Well, first of all, I didn't work in the administration. I worked on the campaign and I previously worked at the State Department. But I agree with you that the Obama administration did not do enough in 2009. So it's a mistake for us to follow the same game plan. And President Trump has been wise to state very clearly up front that he supports regime change. That is the U.S. policy, and we need to state that, and we need to state our support for the protesters. But we need to do more than just tweet. We have to support the protesters by putting more, more sanctions in place on the Revolutionary Guard in Iran and mm -hmm. pushing the U.N. to do more against Iran. We have to actively support these protesters, but at the same time, we can't let the Iranian regime use it as a talking point that this is a U.S.-led effort. It has yeah. to be an Iranian-led effort with the U.S. doing everything it can behind the scenes to support the protesters. Yeah, that's a great point, David, and that's where it becomes tricky. Um, they, they've tried to cut down internet access to people. They've been trying to yeah. um, basically put a stranglehold on these protests, as you know, uh, Colonel, and, and what the regime does, and they do it all the time, is say, oh, these are just propped up by outside entities like the United States and Israel. Yeah, Martha, the regime's going to say that and do that anyway, regardless, and they have for, for years now. But I'll take, you know, I'm in violent agreement with David on this, but I'll take it a step further. This Obama-era argument that we should stand by while people are arrested, tortured, even killed for standing up against a theocratic dictatorship that has killed Americans since the 1980s and continue to hold Americans hostage today is a red herring. And it was an excuse from the Obama administration because at the beginning, from the outset, they wanted an Iran deal and they wanted to do nothing to stir the waters from Tehran to Damascus to Lebanon to get that deal through. And now these people have seen hundreds of billions of dollars flow back into their country, sanctions be lifted, particularly by the Europeans, and nothing in their lives have changed except that the regime has gotten richer and they're paying for foreign wars. These people are protesting because they're hungry, not yeah. for political reasons. And what I hope the president will do next is to begin, as David suggested, supporting them with material aid, with communications equipment, and with other covert means 
to go for the throat of the regime because that's the only way they're going to stop. Yeah, I mean, there has been a restive population in uh, in Iran that has so much infrastructure, so much history, so much education. I mean, th th if there's a place where there is the potential for this to be really dramatic and, and very constructive, it's Iran, right, David? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a moment in Iran, and it would be a mistake for us to miss this moment. And as the political article that Agreed. you cited suggests, this it may not happen right away. This may be the beginning of the end. This These protests may be put down, but there's a movement in Iran that one day, hopefully soon, is going to ultimately overturn the police state that is the Ar Iranian regime right now, and we need to be behind that. That's the future of Iran. That's yeah. the future of the Middle East. I, I know. I mean, you look at the time and uh, breath that is spent, you know, talking about this book, and you see what's happening here. This is history potentially uh, unfolding before our eyes and it's really important for everybody to keep a close watch on. David and uh, Lieutenant Michael Wall, thank you very much. Great to see you All right. tonight. Thanks, thank you. Martha. So the Trump administration taking a dramatic step today that has immigration activists furious. Did the administration go too far or is this exactly what the people who voted for President Trump want him to do? And being met with strong pushback from some circles, where do we draw the line? Should immigrants be allowed to stay forever, even if they were only given a temporary right to come to this country? Big issue. We will debate it right after this on The Story. Time to give Salvadoran and all TPS holders citizenship. Big reaction and protest today as the Trump administration says that it will end special protections for Salvadoran immigrants. Some 200,000 Salvadorans have enjoyed, quote, temporary protected status in this country since earthquakes hit their Central American country back in 2001, and there were provisions made for them to move here during the repair process. But they could now be forced to leave the United States by September of 2019, or so they have 18 months essentially to leave the country or to make other arrangements or potentially face deportation. So here now, Tammy Bruce, columnist for The Washington Times, and Richard Fowler, nationally syndicated radio talk show host, both are Fox News contributors. Um, you know, this was always intended to be a, a temporary situation. It also exists with Honduras, with Haiti. Um, President Trump is standing by his promise and assurances during the election, Tammy, that he would change and stick to the rules of our immigration policies. Yes, and keep in mind, President Trump isn't the one who started this. Actually, President Obama also began, uh, if, if, I don't want to call it deporting, but removing many of the Salvadorans in particular, thousands of year, uh, per year for the last several years. So this is not a new activity. The difference is, is that President Trump announced it. Uh, he said, you know, we recognize how many there are here and that there was a deliberate announcement to the American people that this was policy, that there's a reason why the word temporary is in, is in the name of the protection uh, and that this was important to do. At the same time, the Department of Homeland Security has noted uh, that many people may have an issue with that the administration may be even open to amnesty for these individuals. So you've got a year and a half here for us to figure this out. Uh, but if the amnesty for the Dreamers, as an example, as the CBO has noted, will cost us $26 billion over nine years, uh, I'm wondering how the deficit hawks in Congress would look at that in the financial impact of, of amnesty. They were brought here on a temporary arrangement, Richard. Um, it, you know, now the schools have been repaired, the roads have been repaired, and they look at all of the parameters of that agreement and say, you know, it, it's time to go back. Well, uh, this is an interesting, an interesting topic and an interesting subject in particular. And I think maybe I'm a little reminiscent. So my mom retired on Friday after uh, she's an immigrant to this country from the nation of Jamaica, and she immigrated here legally. Um, but after 40 years of service in, in, as a registered nurse in a public hospital, she retired. Um, and I think for me, she always say growing up, you can't know where you're going until you remember where you came from. And so for me, immigrant blood runs through my veins, and it runs through many of the, all three of our veins. It runs of through because at one point in time we were immigrants to this country. Yes. And and so for these individuals, while yes, their, their status is temporary, we are a nation of immigrants and we have all we are such a blessed country and because of that we've opened up our hands we've opened up our hearts to these so individuals. So there's no limits there's no so, parameters no, no, no. there's and no but let's be very, but let's the be very borders clear. open everyone should come no, no, in if you're going to contribute. Be, I think wait 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 but I think opening up the borders is different. These individuals came here for humanitarian reasons. The Haitians right. are very similar. Nepal the Nepalese are very similar. Yemen there's some folks here from Yemen who are under TPS status. Understood. They've come here, they've contributed to our economy. A, a good majority of them 
work. A lot of them buy mortgages. They got married. They have children. I, and so now I, for us to rip their culture away from them, that's not who we are as Americans. Well, let me, let me that's also not who add, we are as Christians. And I, I think that's adding not who to, we are for Richard's the fact we're such a gracious premise. country. If I could add to Rich's premise. <laughs> The issue is, is that there's also, when you have a, a certain number of people here who are immigrants, even if they're considered refugees, that means that the numbers of other individuals who'd want to come here are capped. So you have, as an example, uh, Filipinos, people from the Philippines, who can't get here because there's a zero dynamic. The same with, actually, M Mexicans who want to immigrate legally. They, they can't immigrate legally because there's a cap. So uh, we want to be able to embrace everyone, but within the framework of following the rules. And I'll remind you, some of this began after, in the 80s, after the Civil War in El Salvador, a refugee stream into California, whereas in uh, MS-13, uh, then moved into the United States, now a transnational terrorist group, essentially. So we, we, when we have emergencies, the vetting process changes, things are done quickly, and we've got to stick with the rule of law, which is what the president promised, mm -hmm. and yet obviously having a year and a half to figure out exactly how to approach this. Yep. But we've got to be conscious I about it and transparent. I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I, 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 I got to jump in. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll continue this conversation, I promise. Uh, we'll start with you, Richard. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Thanks, quick break. President Trump makes a pit stop to deliver a message to the forgotten men and women of the country in Nashville today. We'll be right back. Farm country is God's country. We leave you with this tonight. Live look at Atlanta, where the president is about to be there for the kickoff of the National College Championship for football. Crimson Tide versus the Georgia Bulldogs on his way there tonight. The president stopped in Nashville and he spoke to the Farmers Bureau there. And this is the soundbite of the night. Listen. Our task is to uphold the values and principles that define who we are as a nation and as a people. The character that stormed the beaches of Normandy and the courage that sent pilgrims across the ocean and astronauts to the moon. Then there is nothing we can't do. No doubt the president happy to be uh, out of Washington for a few hours today and taking that game tonight. That's our story tonight. We'll see you here tomorrow night.